Hi, I'm Robin Grosinger. I'm a senior scientist at the San Francisco Estuary Institute, where I co-direct our Resilient Landscapes program. And I'm Erica Spotswood, also a senior scientist at SFBI. Today, we're gonna to talk about urban biodiversity planning. That means how to bring nature back into cities to make them healthier, more resilient, and full of the diversity of life. So we're gonna talk about biodiversity in cities. First, what is biodiversity? Biodiversity is the diversity of life on Earth, plants, animals, and all the other life forms that make up the diverse ecosystems of the world. We depend on this diversity for the basic necessities of life, from healthy soils to pollination of our crops to clean air and water. But biodiversity, as you may know, is not doing well. Up to one million species are currently threatened with extinction. And around 10% of all terrestrial species, land-based species, don't have enough habitat for long-term survival. In North America alone, there are three billion fewer birds than there were 50 years ago. Now let's look at cities. We think of cities as places that don't support biodiversity, but they actually can to a surprising degree. From centuries old valley oaks in suburbia, to downtown coyotes, the slender lorises of the trees of Bangalore, migrating monarch butterflies finding a tiny patch of milkweed hidden in the city, to snake's head fritillaries coming back in a former industrial site in London. Cities can support biodiversity. But cities are also bad for biodiversity. They're dissected by roads, overwhelmed by pavement and buildings that limit available habitat and movement for wildlife. They contain pollution, bright lights, noise, cars, that all threaten wildlife and also have negative impacts on people. Yet, as we'll explore today, we're learning from urban ecology research, which is the study of how nature works in cities, that some spaces are better than others for biodiversity. And we can learn from this practical ways, a design language, if you will, for creating cities with nature in mind, which is important because nature makes people healthier. Growing research shows, for example, that access to parks improves physical health. Proximity to nature reduces mental stress and urban tree canopy substantially reduces depression. Parks, trees, and nature also tend to bring people together, increasing social cohesion. Planning for urban biodiversity then can make these benefits of nature, getting outside, the sense of wonder, curiosity, connection, and learning, accessible to a much broader range of people than it generally has been, contributing to community health across cities. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Erica to show us the principles of urban biodiversity. Today, nature is often neglected or forgotten in cities, treated poorly, underfunded, and sometimes deprioritized. To make cities more biodiverse, we will need to invest in prioritizing nature. We can do this by creating biodiversity planning that draws on science. The science of urban ecology can be helpful here because for decades, it's been documenting patterns of where species are found and where they are not found in urban landscapes. To give you an example, in Melbourne, Australia, researchers sampled golf courses, public parks, parks, and residential neighborhoods. In each, they measured the vegetation, the amount, the number of species, and how many were native. And they also measured the richness, or the number of species, of bats, birds, bees, beetles, and bugs. And what they found was that across all of these groups of animals, there, were, there tended to be more species in places that had more, a higher proportion of native vegetation. In another study in from Vienna, Austria, bird communities were measured in 36 urban parks that varied in size from 0.4 to 34.5 hectares. Groups of ornithologists surveyed each park, each of 36 parks, one time per month across three years. Bird species richness in this study was positively related to the size of the park, so larger parks tended to have more species in them. This science gives us information that can be used to design and improve urban landscapes with nature, and to do it in a way that is most likely to support biodiversity. And by supporting biodiversity, we'll also support human well-being because what we're finding is that biodiverse spaces are also the ones that provide some of the biggest psychological benefits to people when they're visiting. We've spent the past few years bringing together the science to develop actionable recommendations for how to plan for and design for biodiversity support in cities. And what we've learned is that the types of locations and actions that tend to support biodiversity can be broadly grouped into seven core principles. And I'll go through each of those in detail here. The first is the size of a patch of green space, or patch size. Patches of green space can include large parks, small or local pocket parks, and vacant lots. 
Green spaces, especially large ones, support more species than almost every, any other type of feature in the urban landscape. And large parks often contain areas of natural habitat that can support species that are not found anywhere else in the urban landscape. This pattern of positive relationship between the number of species and the size of an urban green space has been found over and over in studies across the world in many different cities. And this is why we put patch size as perhaps the most important principle. We put it first because of its important role in supporting biodiversity. The second principle is connections. These are features that enable plants and animals to move across the urban landscape. They include corridors or linear green features that enable plants and animals to travel long distances without being interrupted. Some examples of urban features that can act as con con connections are corridors that run along rivers, rivers or streams, greenways, green streets, and wildlife crossings that enable movement across roads and reduce road fatalities. Species movement is an, essential, is an essential function for both animals and plants. The more highly connected green features are in the urban landscape, the more easily it is for, for a species to move from one place to another. For wildlife or for animals, this might me mean enabling movement from, uh, from a place where you sleep to a place where you can find food. For plants, movement means dispersing your seeds and being able to establish new populations and new individuals in new locations, supporting both biodiversity and resilience for plant populations. The third principle is matrix quality, or the quality of habitat in the green elements in the areas around parks and corridors. This includes all the smaller green features found in public and private spaces, including the publicly owned trees, private residential backyards and residential trees, green infrastructure features such as bioswales, stormwater detention ponds, and landscaped areas on both public and private spaces. When these features are numerous and well-connected, they can create habitat that can supplement the habitat found in parks. Several studies from across the world have found that when urban parks are surrounded by high quality matrix, they tend to support more species than similarly sized parks that have less high quality that are surrounded by really highly built, built up areas. The fourth principle is habitat diversity. This is the diversity of the different types, uh, the diversity and number of different types of habitats. Habitat types are essentially the assemblages of plants and animals that live together. For example, grassland, shrublands, and temperate deciduous forests are all examples of types of habitats. Urbanization often destroys the coherence in habitat types. For example, along a single street, you may have multiple yards or landscaped areas, all of which have completely different sets of plants living in them. In order to, to, uh, to reduce this fragmentation, habitat zones can be created at the city scale. That can, and, and in doing so, this can designate areas where appropriate habitat types could be located. This can both increase the coherence of habitats at the fine scale and also increase the diversity of habitats across the city. Most animals and plants need particular conditions created by particular habitat types. Encouraging the creation of coherence in habitat types can increase the number of spaces that can be used by more types of organisms and can support greater biodiversity. The fifth, fifth principle is native vegetation, or the presence, abundance, and richness of species that are native or evolved in a particular place. Promoting native vegetation in cities can include planting and protecting native species and, and removing invasive species. Uh, plants can be planted in a way that encourages diversity, so planting many different types of species, and can also be done in a way that supports, uh, supports wildlife. So for example, plants can be planted that provide year-round resources for pollinating bees and butterflies, and provide other types of food, such as acorns, flowers, fruits, and nuts. Many animals have evolved to use the resources produced by native plants in the habitats where they live. And this often means that they have more trouble using non-native plants than they have using native plants. Therefore, encouraging the planting and protection of native plants can both encourage the diversity of native vegetation and can also help support wildlife, therefore supporting more total species overall. The sixth principle is special resources. Or these are special types of locations that serve particular functions for particular groups of species. The most notable of these include large trees and water features, but they can also include things like bird boxes or bat boxes in urban landscapes that mimic natural features such as holes or roosting sites in caves. These resources are necessary for many species and are often limiting resources, particularly in urban landscapes. For example, there are many birds that nest in holes in trees. And even if a bird is able to find food in an urban landscape, if it can't find a hole in a tree, it may, may not be able to re reproduce there and create a self-sustaining population. Large trees are really important here because they often contain soft wood that can be drilled by woodpeckers to create holes that many other birds can nest in. Similarly, water is a feature 
that nearly all species need frequent access to, both plants and animals. Where it is present, it can support both aquatic and terrestrial species, and both plants and animals. The final principle is management. This is an assemblage of actions that people take in cities that have an impact on biodiversity. And this includes both things that are supportive of biodiversity, like leaving down logged and logs and leaf litter in place in order to encourage soil fertility and to promote decomposition and provide habitat for animals. This can also include things like bird-friendly window design and installing bird boxes that can help supplement the, the absence of uh, nesting sites for birds in cities. This also includes actions that are detrimental that we should, that we should discourage for biodiversity's um, purposes. This includes things like too much light pollution, um, really highly manicured lawns, the pruning of trees, the management of vegetation, how frequent mowing takes place, and things like the addition of chemicals associated with pesticides and, and, and fertilizers. All of these things can be disruptive to wildlife and can limit diversity in, the places, in, in a place. Therefore, reducing these types of disturbances can help support biodiversity. So we know that all of these principles are important, but we also know that each of them does a slightly different thing and potentially provides opportunities for slightly different suites of species of plants and animals. And so we know because of this, we can conclude that it is the assemblage of all of these principles together and the planning for all of them together that it would be most likely to maximize the support for biodiversity. So how do we do this? How do we make these, these principles actionable? And how do we use them as a guide to guide interventions that will make cities more ecologically friendly? Any city, city interested in how to plan for biodiversity should start by thinking about where their biodiversity assets are already located and where they are missing. So for example, every city already has parks. They already have existing street trees and greenways or river corridors. These are features that can be built upon and improved upon in order to support more species. Likewise, every city has places that lack parks or places, neighborhoods with fewer trees in them. And these green resources are often inequitably distributed. So cities can identify places where they can conduct interventions that would reduce the inequity in the distribution of trees or parks. And in this process, they can help to support biodiversity as well. So this process of planning for biodiversity can start with identifying actions and gathering data and quantifying the existing resources that a city might already have. So we've gone through this exercise in Silicon Valley, California, where we identified data sources associated with each of the principles I just walked through. And I won't show you all of them, but just to give you an example. To identify patch size, we gathered data from, uh, on the, uh, the presence and size of all the parks in Silicon Valley across all of the cities. We found that while all cities had parks, there were relatively few large parks, and there were also many areas that lacked parks. We also found networks of parks along two river corridors running through the city of San Jose that formed arteries that could support, that are existing sources of support for connectivity. We built upon that, those sources of connectivity, to identify connections. We mapped the main stream corridors in Silicon Valley because we recognized that here on this landscape, the main sources of connectivity are associated with the streams and rivers. Identifying where streams run underground, where they are above ground, and where they contain vegetation along the banks provides a starting place for identifying where sources of connectivity lie and where they could be improved. Gathering data to identify existing actions can help us identify and prioritize actions that could be associated with improving biodiversity support. The list of potential things that one could do are long, and we will not identify all of them here, but the, the actions that one could take could include preserving and conserving existing large, high-quality green spaces that are already in place, prioritizing the acquisition of land to create new parks, in, particularly in places that are park poor, to, uh, or to, um, to fill gaps in existing corridors, or to increase the size of existing parks. We could also think about transforming decommissioned infrastructure corridors into greenways that can enhance connectivity. And finally, we can support programs that are encourage the planting of native plants in, in private residential spaces as a mechanism for encouraging the improvement of the quality of the matrix. There are many good examples of the seven principles in action. I'll just show a couple here. Camley Street Natural Park is a former coal yard that was restored by the London Wildlife Trust into a one hectare ecological patch with a diverse range of native species and popular educational programs. In San Francisco, local residents and a nonprofit group, Nature in the City, are planting host plants in the matrix to create connections between habitat patches and habitat diversity for the green hair streak butterfly. These and many other examples in cities around the world 
show that it's possible to transform the nature of an urban site. But to really achieve the benefits we need from nature in our cities, we need to systematically make improvements across the whole landscape, linking these different types of actions across scales and ownership into a network of nature, an ecological grid, like the electrical or street grid, that distributes high quality nature and its benefits throughout the city. Drawing on the science of urban biodiversity, we can creatively build this essential infrastructure for healthy and resilient cities. Thanks for listening. Thank you.